Jonathan Simon, who uh, again has been there since the beginning, the man who downloaded the exit polls and has been in angst and agitated and active every since, really, quite literally, one of the legendary figures in election integrity. And my good friend, uh, we, we speak uh, around the country together, uh, and a man who's written a brilliant book, Code Red, Jonathan Simon. Hi, uh, thank you for everyone who's still here, and, um, and also for uh, those who are uh, tuned in on the live stream. You know, I, I've changed my, my tune about what I was going to uh, present about 12 times or so already today, because we keep going this way and that way, and, 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 and summing it all is, is very difficult. I actually have a, a very... Uh, Basic, uh, my, my very first foray into PowerPoint, uh, so it's a two-slide PowerPoint. And, <laughs> and um, you know, it, it, it's, it sort of picks up a little bit where, where Stephanie uh, left off. And you can see how deep into the weeds this gets when we actually start talking about uh, the nuts and bolts of audits. I had about 15 pages on the nuts and bolts of audits, which would take really uh, well into the night. Um, and, and it does get sticky, uh, and it does come down to, okay, here's your design, but where's your execution? Um, how does it work in the real world? How does it work when people are tired? How does it work when people aren't looking? How does it work when you don't have enough people to look? Um, how does it work when you start getting into numbers and people are not comfortable with the, with the numbers? So what I came up with, and this is just fairly recently, and it's sort of like a trial, we're sort of at the pre-alpha test uh, stage here, um, is something that could take uh, the principles of a flat audit and the principles of a risk-limiting audit, uh, which are, are quite different, as, as we know, and sort of hybridize them a little bit. So you'd get some of the benefits of the risk-limiting concept um, without imposing some of the burdens of risk limiting. Um, and again, there's going to be quite a bit tomorrow about uh, the nuts and bolts of, of risk limiting. So I'm not going to go there too much, but I mean, the, the basic premise of it um, is that uh, when elections aren't close, you don't have to count a lot of ballots. Um, and you're, you're just, you're really looking at auditing the number of precincts or the number of ballots necessitated by a particular election. And that, um, in a conceptual framework, is, is fairly brilliant. Um, because the last thing you want to be doing is, is unnecessarily counting hundreds of thousands or millions of ballots that don't need to be counted. The problem with the risk-limiting approach um, is that, as we've seen, there's a certain amount of chain of custody issue. There's a certain amount of taking things on faith if you're not uh, well-versed in this kind of stuff. And there's also a lot of variability to it. Like, well, how many ballots do we count uh, tonight, do we count 1%, do we count 2.84%, do we count uh, a million, do we count 486,000, et cetera, et cetera. And what I've seen, based on pretty limited experience, but, but certainly through uh, secondhand uh, talking and consultation, um, is that uh, on election night, people really like routine. And they like to do the same thing every year. Um, and so when you start adding an additional element to that routine, um, it, it can get pretty dicey and it can get pretty conflictual as well uh, when there's some disagreement about whether this or that percentage or number is the right number. So what I want to do is I, I want to just um, mention um, what is, I'm trying to leave myself time for a, a grand finale here and I, I hope I, I can bifurcate effectively here. Um, so I can talk about something else which is near and dear to me um, that's a little more expansive than this, uh, than this audit. But I, I do want to get this out there. Um, and, and so I'm going to skip the part about what an effective audit has to do, because it's an eight-part presentation, except to say that one of the real key things is to have both sensitivity and selectivity. And by that I mean You've got to be able to pick it up when there are um, disparities, um, things that go bump in the night, that have some prospect of altering the outcome of an election. Really, that's what we're concerned about, is who wins. Uh, not particularly by how much. Uh, we're building a long bridge here, and, and we're changing a lot 
um, in our electoral processes. And it's already something of a bridge too far from the standpoint of, of most election administrators and even the media. Um, so you don't want to make it even three inches longer than it has to be. We want to know who won elections. And so purists, you know, will have to sort of leave the room or cover their ears um, because we're not all that concerned whether you won 92 to 8 or 91 to 9 or 89 to 11 um, in, this, in these elections. So sensitivity and selectivity, which means that the audit doesn't pick up the noise. We know there's a lot of noise in elections. Karen McKim was talking about it. Um, in Wisconsin, all these errors all over the place. And I'm afraid that that's somewhat endemic to the system that it really probably doesn't matter how we count, whether we count by hand or we count by machine or we count by DRE, there's going to be some noise in the system when you're dealing with a lot of large numbers. You don't want your audit to flag ordinary noise that is just, that is just a wash. It's an error this way, it's an error that way. Um, because we really want to be able to focus on the ones that are fraud. And we want to be able to deter the ones that are fraud. I mean, an audit is designed to detect, but what it's really designed to do, as we know from banks and whatnot, um, is to deter. So we don't have to detect. I mean, the, the rational actor who's thinking about rigging an election and knows that there's a good audit in place um, is going to recalculate that, that risk-reward ratio and say, well, maybe, maybe I'd better not. So that's what we really want. So we're focusing on that. We don't want to pick up a lot of noise, but the audit needs to have an automatic process of escalation. And we've, we've heard the word escalation today. Um, this is key. If you, if you just have an audit that says, okay, so you get this result and then, you know, you kind of have an option about what to do about it or ask him what to do about it, um, that's not going to work. It has to be built into the legislation. So with that in mind, what I'm going to suggest is that one of the least important things when you're conceptualizing an audit um, is that the actual size of the sample, um, how big a flat audit to do, you know, in the vast majority of cases, when you're talking about anything from a house race, U.S. house race on up, 1% uh, will pretty much do it for any competitive election. Competitive elections tend to have more votes, there are more ballots to audit, you can audit 1%. Key decision has to be made in applying audits, and that is whether we're going to um, sample ballots or we're going to sample precincts and that's a whole separate issue which I hope people will get to tomorrow because it leads to very different pathways in terms of what you're comparing to what. If you're going to sample ballots, which really is the, is the best way statistically, you got to sample those ballots from every pile wherever they are and that includes mail-in bags and it includes every precinct, um, early voting, provisional ballots, et cetera, et cetera, in order to get a representative sample. That's a, that's a pretty significant demand. Um, the good news is that the sample doesn't have to be very large. And what I'm going to propose is that you can have a flat sample, let's say a 1% sample, uh, as they've been doing in California. And what we're going to suggest here is the way you bring in the risk limiting part is you peg the accuracy threshold of the audit. That is the acceptable percentage disparity between the vote count and the audit before you scream, before you red flag it and say, okay, we gotta escalate, we gotta audit more ballots, we gotta go to a full recount. You peg that to the vote count margin of victory. So, give a second for that to sink in. That's gonna be something that sounds a lot like a risk limiting audit except that instead of the risk-limiting audit determining how many ballots you count, or what proportion of the ballots you count, that's gonna be fixed. And instead, it's gonna determine when it raises a red flag. Okay, so, what you could do is you could have a piece of legislation, you could say, we're gonna, we're gonna audit these type of races, and you could say, we're going to audit 1%. You could say 2%, you could say 3%, X percent, but call it 1%. And if the audit margin of victory is less than, let's say, half, it's a pretty good round number, half the vote count margin of victory, that will trigger escalation. Okay. So you got this vote count margin of victory. What we know is that the vast majority of races are not close. And what that means is that when that vote count margin of victory is 40, let's say, you got an election that's 70 to 30, 
your audit doesn't have to be very close to that, to that margin of victory. First of all, if it's greater than the margin of victory, the election passes. It's not in the direction where it suggests that there could be a different result. And if it's less than the margin of victory, but only 5% or so, and the, rate, and the margin of victory is 40%, the election also passes. It's, the audit is not suggesting that this result could be different. Um, so one of the ways uh, to illustrate this, I, I, I've never used a pointer in my life, and, and now I get the chance, I think, except I can't see what's up there. Um, got, the mic. got the mic, we got the pointer. So we're just going to have two, two basic slides here. And I said beware the math, but it's really pretty simple. Well, the first one is an election that goes 70-30. So VMOV, vote count margin of victory, is 40, right? 70% for A, 30% for B. Half of that is 20. VMOV over two is 20. Okay, so that becomes your standard. That's written into the legislation. Everybody knows that going in. They don't have to wait till election night to find out. Audit number one of such an election, 64-34. Audit margin of victory is 32. 32 is greater than 20. The election passes. Why? Because the audit's in the neighborhood, mathematically in the neighborhood, of the vote count. Right? So it passes. Audit number two, you got 95 to five. Now this audit is way off. Somebody really screwed up this election, but they didn't screw it up in a dangerous direction. They could have screwed up the audit, they could have screwed up the election. Doesn't matter. Audit margin of victory is 90. 90 is greater than 20. In fact, it's greater than 40. It's greater than the, than the, the vote count margin of victory. Election passes. We don't really care about that election. There's no suggestion in that audit anywhere that there was a different outcome. We may start wondering about our counting processes, which is a, a useful thing to do, but we're not going to have to escalate on that one. Now you get one is the audit's 58 to 42. Margin of victory in the audit is 16. 16 is less than 20, i.e. it's more than halfway towards where that outcome could have been reversed that one you escalate. And so this is a general principle. I mean, I've just given an example uh, where you've written into the legislation one half, VMOV over two. It could be VMOV over four, over three, over five. I mean, that's a question of legislative lobbying, how, how much of a standard you want to put. I actually think the half standard is very simple, and it, and it actually would be pretty effective. Next slide, please. Um, I've waited my whole life to say that. Um, <laughs> Now we, have, now we have a close election. These are the ones that we probably care about because, let's face it, the 70-30 elections are kind of smell test uh, problems uh, if you rig one of those. Not that it hasn't been done, but if you reverse one of those, uh, you got you know, some fair chance of, of questions being asked with or without an audit. So, because um, there will be if not exit polls, there'll be pre-election polls, there'll be all sorts of stuff. So the ones we're kind of really worried about are these close ones here, 52 to 48. Vote count margin of victory, that should be MOV, um, is four. Half of that is two. Okay, first audit. Audit comes in at 55, 45, so it's more in the direction of victory. In other words, a bigger victory. Margin of, audit margin of victory is 10. 10 is greater than 2, you pass. Um, now, that may look like a pretty suspicious audit. It's off by 3%, whatever. But it's in that direction. We don't want to go there. We don't want to be trouble with those. Second one, audit 49.51, audit margin of victory minus 2. There's no absolute value here. It's minus 2. Uh, we're looking at it from the standpoint of candidate A over candidate B. Minus 2 is less than 2, so we escalate. And whenever the audit comes, and this is just logical and you can put this into the legislation, whenever the audit comes out with a different result, different winner from the election, from the vote count, you escalate. Doesn't matter what the numbers are. So that just makes just common sense. Now you get one that's 50.8 to 49.2. Audit margin of victory is 1.6. 1.6 is less than two. 
you escalate. You go to the next level or the re full recount. But if it was 51.2 to 48.8, audit margin of victory is 2.4. Greater than two, the election passes. So this is a sim a, basically a pretty simple way um, of bringing in that risk-limiting principle without, um, I don't know, without, uh, sorry, Stephanie, but without doing, a, you know, making money, because um, I don't think this would actually require any, any particular uh, sophistication of programming. And so it's just something I'm throwing out there. We'll put it on the website and, um, and, and see what, what kind of, uh, you know, reception it gets. I, I, as I said, it's very preliminary. Um, and it may, be, it may be a way to go to get wider adoption and also um, more comfort with a process that, that is going to be new. We're also obviously going to see how it works in Rhode Island, how it works in Colorado, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's my constructive homage to Jim, who said, be, be positive and be constructive. And now, I don't know how much time I have left, but if I have time to read a page and a half or so, um, comes the impassioned, um, not quite at the level of the left forum for anybody who saw that clip where, <laughs> <laughs> where I was <laughs> waxing profane and steam was coming out of my ears. Um, but, uh, but, but trying to sum up some of, of at least what I feel um, uh, about what we're looking at here and about the levels of inertia that we're up against. And, and, and Karl Rove has skated today. I'm not going to go after Karl Rove, but I, we haven't heard his name. We got through, I don't know, 10 hours of election integrity without the name Karl Rove coming up. Um, but I'm thinking here more in terms of the, of the media. And, and they've gotten a pretty free ride today as well. And uh, I want to end it right now. So this is a, a draft, uh, excerpts from a draft of the foreword to the new edition of my book, the one that's going to be out next year, uh, the 2018 edition of Code Red, Computerized Election Theft, and the New American Century. And just bear with me, and I, I hope it doesn't keep us here uh, too long. I'll, I'll try, to, try to economize. These times beset by lies cry out for honesty. If we are to survive the age of Trump and find our way back, I think we can, does this work this way? I don't know. Okay, there we go. If we are to survive the age of Trump and find our way back from the brink of surrealism, it will have to start with our best efforts to describe reality as we see it, building upon facts, and not shrinking either out of tact or on the sage advice of the marketing department from calling a spade anything but a spade. I can think of no more honest way to introduce myself and what I'm about in this book than to copy in the text of an email I sent recently to the editor of the New Yorker magazine, David Remnick, in response to an article of his entitled The Divider. Who's, who's a New Yorker reader here? Okay, well, it's a wonderful, you know, wonderful magazine, mostly the fictional stuff, which includes most of the non-fictional stuff. Um, and David's a wonderful guy, and he's done wonderful things. Um, I think it speaks for itself, and I will pick you up if you're still there on the other side. Dear David, yet another Trumpian outrage, Charlottesville, but does it really matter which one? Yet another Remnickian outcry, the divider, but ditto. Resist, resist, you say. Yes, okay, in every way we can. I assume we're ruling out guns and bombs, so then parades and petitions and protests and poll responses and little acts of decency and fairness and kindness for whatever that gets us. And then next year we get to vote. And those votes become strings of ones and zeros, yes, even in op scans, counted behind an impenetrable curtain. Paper, you say, recounts, you say. Study December 2016 well, I say, and take careful note of what became of the paper and the recounts. Counted there somewhere in the pitch dark of cyberspace by the likes of ESNS, Dominion, oh Lord, and Command Central, yes sir. Those ones and zeros elected not just Donald Trump, but if you can bring yourself to consider the reams of statistical forensics pattern data, good enough for everything from astronomy to agronomy, Enough right-wingers at both federal and state levels to give the radicalized GOP the majorities it needs to keep enabling the cancer-in-chief in his depravity. So you tell us to resist. Is or, not, is or is not the media having the time of its life with this? 
but do next to nothing to protect our primary, indeed only, effectual means of doing so. You have dropped the ball consistently, disastrously. You are, in your blinded, never happen here passivity, complicit. A strong indictment, but if you're still reading, and it takes valor to read such a scathing critique, ask Trump, who squeals like a stuck pig at far milder pokes, not beyond remedy, but you'd have to get on the stick hard and soon. Start making it a regular feature. You know that with the prevailing national attention span, once or twice won't do it. An exploration of the rot at the core of the most foundational protocol of our democracy and a clarion call for the restoration of public observable vote counting in time for 2018 and 2020. I'll write it for you for free or put Evan Osnos on it or write it yourself, there's no one better. Blame it on the Russians if you must, though insiders have been working this game since Hava passed in 2002 at least long before the Russians took an interest. Whatever. Just please recognize that. One, resistance comes down to elections. Two, elections come down to the counting of votes. Three, vote counting in the U.S. is absurdly vulnerable to computerized manipulation and alteration. Four, the political universe is well stocked with ends justify the means true believers and cynics more than willing and demonstrably able to exploit that vulnerability. And most important, five, this nightmare could and would end with one stinking honestly and accurately, i.e. publicly and observably counted election. Ask the Dutch, ask the Germans, ask the Irish, ask the Canadians, now you can ask the Norwegians, is America really that exceptionally stupid as to go it alone in not getting it? Will it be America's fate to succumb to fascism by fraud because its David Remnicks could not bear to look seriously and open-mindedly at the evidence of how it was happening? With appreciation for all your good work, with a shred of hope, with best wishes, Jonathan. I write many such missives. Thanks, I, I think you're giving it a better reception than, than he, he probably did, but. I, I write many such missives, sometimes as many as a dozen a day, and there have been thousands of days since this all got rolling. Some are more tactful, less irritable, less urgent, some even angrier, more frustrated, more desperate. I rarely expect answers, and my expectations are rarely disappointed. You could populate a good-sized village with bright, thoughtful, patriotic, non-responding shoulder shruggers. Democracy begins to end when its beneficiaries go lazy and passive, when they are seduced by speed, ease, convenience, entertainment, and that happened before Trump. In fact, the cancer became stage four when the U.S. began counting votes in the pitch dark of cyberspace, entrusting the critical process to a handful of private, partisan, secretive outfits, and expecting in fact, with unshakable blind faith that it would proceed honestly and accurately. After all, we figured, we can see why someone would shoot up with PEDs to win the Tour de France, but who would ever want to steal a US election? The evidence is plentiful that the Republican, and not just the Republican, but transmogrified far-right Republican hegemony at both national and state levels owes its existence with but-for causality to the targeted manipulation of vote counts over the past 15 years. And of course, we'll throw in the other many, many thumbs on the scale, and one of the things we've seen today uh, is that if you govern abysmally enough, you gotta come up with more thumbs and make them heavier, uh, hence the Kobach Commission and various other uh, thumbs uh, that are gonna be coming down hard on that scale in 2018 and 2020. And it is that hegemony that is enabling the monster Trump, though it is clear enough that the Democrats, who sit idly and silently by as they suffer one shocking defeat after another, who sit idly and silently by as recounts are thwarted, who simply use the latest defeat and GOP depravity for yet more desperate fundraising, have no greater interest than do their right-wing counterparts in restoring public sovereignty. And the media, well, as I wrote to David, it's having the time of its life Nothing like a horny dragon to slay, but public observable vote counting, serious electoral reform? No, we don't go there. 
And while I enjoy in a grim sort of way the torrents of Trump disparaging, disparaging adjectives and adverbs, I really don't see much hope in it. At some point, 2018, 2020, it comes down to elections, and that comes down to vote counting. And if that remains computerized, privatized, and secret, I don't see any reason to expect reason to prevail over derangement. We have watched the situation go from perilous to critical to surrealistic. Let's hope it has not gone beyond rescue. There's an old joke about a guy who jumps off the top of the Empire State Building. Someone with an office on the 40th floor sticks her head out the window and asks, how's he doing? Okay, so far, comes the answer. If this once applied to America in the computerized voting era, that time is past. I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. I have questions? Is there time? I don't know. I'd be happy to take questions. I don't know what the time, I lost track of time there. Uh, are there any questions? Go ahead. Um, I, I thought your presentation on audits made a lot of sense, but I just wanted to add one caveat. And as, as David Carey had spoke earlier about how proportional representation would resolve the redistricting gerrymandering question, if we were in proportional representation elections, of course, the percentage of vote isn't just about who has a majority or a smaller one. And a lot of public financing schemes are a function of what percentage, and usually it's if somebody gets five or 10%, they get that much public financing. And in the case of the presidential race, had Jill Stein gotten 5%, that would have qualified the Green Party for public financing. So it's a, you know, it's just in, in other systems, it would be even more important to nail down an accurate vote than in our system because a swing of two or three percent could change the entire government and change many different people who are elected in a proportional representation legislative election. Yes, thanks. I mean, that's an excellent uh, point. And, and there's, you know, uh, look, uh, this is, I'm not sure at this point that there is a one size fit all. Um, solution. Uh, that's why we're, you know, have for many years, 15 years, have been talking about a bifurcated ballot and a, you know, different approach um, to the security of, let's say, the federal and statewide races versus the county races, et cetera, et cetera. Um, not because, you know, we don't believe in the uh, you know, sanctity of all votes and, and whatnot, but just because of the throw weight, the impact that certain types of elections have. And so I think we do recognize that they do have to be treated differently. Obviously, something like this uh, would, the value of something like this is that it's simple and it works for a certain sort of species um, of elections. For another species, uh, we'd have to go to a different uh, approach to, to auditing and security. And of course, the issue with ranked choice voting and, and, ver and its various um, you know, siblings and cousins um, is that, uh, you know, one of the first questions that comes up is, well, could you possibly do this without relying uh, so much on computers um, that we're back in the same soup? That, it, you know, what, what, what good is it if it's ranked choice, if it's, if it's getting rigged? Um, and so there's a real balancing issue there uh, around those two advocacies. Uh, Emily. I didn't have a question, actually, but I want to give a little plug for you. Um, that was really inspiring, and I, I'm, I know I wasn't alone in being inspired by it. And for those of you who are here today who are wondering, how, how could you possibly convey some of what you've learned to people who didn't sit through this many hours, and, and hopefully I'll come back tomorrow too. Um, I had the honor of working with Jonathan to create a blog post that attempts to cover the main issues in a very public-friendly and sometimes humorous way. And I want to point you to it because I think it's a great thing to Dark read humor. and share with your friends. <laughs> um, so it's at his website, which is coderead2016.com. And if you go to the blog, it's called 19 Myths That Government and Elections Don't Want You to Know About or something like that. And it's, li it's the second post down. Um, it's there with, a, can I say this, is there with a date of July 4th. It was actually written before the election last year, but John's site got hacked and it got reposted it on July 4th and updated a little bit. So I encourage you to check that out and, and share it. 
Thank you so much, Emily. I, I have to say my site got hacked primarily because I ignored Emily's warnings and imprecations that I should actually take some concern for its security. I'm, uh, you know, a tech ignoramus, and I was just like, ah, whatever, you know, blah, blah, blah. And of course, it, it not only got hacked, but it got pretty well shredded. Um, and pretty much everything had to be reconstituted, and I haven't gotten it all back yet, but most of it is there. And the 19 myths is, is pretty, you know, this is the kind of thing, I mean, we want, you know, obviously my book, but we want to spread the word in ways that are um, digestible, that make an impact. I mean, Bob always makes an impact. Whenever Bob speaks, you know, people are like, whoa, you know, because, it, it, you know, he may stretch a point here and there, but you can sort of see that... <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit, but you can, you know, it's, it's a story that we're telling. It's a story. When, it's one reason why we've moved away in certain ways from uh, uh, election forensics per se, and you know, they stole this election and we have these percentages and this is how we know. One reason is that we're getting less and less information. They're giving us less and less to work with and that's a whole detailed point, but take my word for it, we're getting less information than we once did. But another one is that when we look backwards and we try to you know, bring the numbers into the room, everybody's eyes glaze over. It's really a story, and it's a story about our country, and it's a story about the theft of our country. Um, it, it can be a partisan or nonpartisan story depending on you know, where you're coming from and what your audience is. Um, the effects have been pretty, pretty obvious. This hasn't been sort of equal opportunity while well, nothing's really changed. I mean, the national politics just keeps veering to the right and veering to the right to the point where you have you know, a populace that's over here being represented by public figures who are over there. Um, that is a recipe for ultimate breakdown or acquiescence. So you either get Storm the Bastille, 19, you know, 1789, or you get Soviet Russia, where everybody knows the whole thing is, is rigged, but you know, nobody feels in, in any way empowered to do anything about it. Either one of those two results is, is probably not something that, that, we, we would, uh, that would be our first choice in the ranked choice voting process. Um, but that's what happens, and you know, uh, one of the things that, that, that stokes my rage more than anything else is, is when I just put myself in the mindset, when I channel Karl Rove or Roger Stone or whoever the hell it is at Dominion, the Urosevich brothers, Jeffrey Dean, who, whoever these operatives are, Skydal, and I can just see them, you know, I can see the snicker on their face because they know that once they got this in, once they got Hava in, once they began to sort of take over all these state houses, and again, you know, we focus mostly on the presidency, uh, the public focus is on the presidency, but the real crime here has been the infrastructure of American politics all the way down to the, to the state legislative level, state secretaries of state, attorney generals, um, attorneys general, you know, they had to have this gleam, this little satisfied smile and a clinking of glasses that they will never get us out because they've taken over the control of the processes. So if you want to change it, what do you have? You have a ballot proposition that's counted on their machines. You're running a candidate for office, uh, you know, that is uh, subject to a, 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 an election counted on their machines. This is a real serious catch-22. It's something that we pointed out a long time ago, and we're seeing it come to fruition. The one good thing we got out of Donald Trump is that some people at least have sort of woken up a little bit more. They're still not at that level that really is necessary um, to understand what the hell is happening to them. Um, but at least there is a, there is a, a, a some showing of, 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 of moxie and spirit, and that's got to increase, and that's got to be organized, and that's got to be channeled. And for another day would be you know the idea of how strong the economic weapons are that this. Uh, that, that, that the American people have in this capitalist culture where corporations depend on this consumption of things that are absolutely not needed. You start choking off and, and, and shutting down that consumption. Think of North Carolina as an example, and you get very rapid results out of those corporate boardrooms, and you get very rapid results out of the politicians that those corporate boardrooms own lock, stock, and barrel. So um, there are some weapons that don't depend on guns and bombs or Antifa or any of this nonsense that actually are our biggest strength as workers, as taxpayers, and as consumers most of all, that if we ever figured out a way how to organize that, and that's just what they're afraid of, the the, the elites um, would, would be very, very powerful tool um, to bring back public sovereignty and bring back um, honest elections. Yeah. Right. Take one more.
So um, it's really just those kinds of questions that you've been getting into uh, that I really came today to hear about. And um, by the way, my, my name is Aaron Reeve, and I don't think I've said that at all today yet. Um, and I, I, you know, I, it's, it's been a little bit of a surprise to me that, and I should have known this, or I should have researched this going in, but today has been much more focused on the machinery, really, of elections and the, uh, the processes of elections themselves, rather than on the kind of social organizing and political organizing that's what you're talking about. And I, I was sort of hoping to learn today, to get some leads um, for how I personally might suspend my normal day-to-day -day way of living and my job and actually for the 2018 elections go volunteer somewhere f looking f toward 20, the 2018 elections um, because um, there have got to be more political organizing ways to outmaneuver uh, the racist voting suppression, you know, the, 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 the racial voting suppression and the fraudulence of the machinery. Um, so, you know, I'm just going to say if anybody has leads on that, I'd love to get them from you. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That is a great question. Um, it's not an easy question. I mean, obviously, the National Voting Rights Task Force is a place, you know, where they're organizing, where you can go, where you can make an impact. Um, it's hard because it's going to take mass public insistence, and nobody is ever, I've been accused of a lot of things, but never been accused of being an organizer. It's not in my DNA. So I'm, I'm a terrible person to answer that with any like, okay, this is what you do. But there are people here uh, who are, that is much stronger uh, part of their repertoire. And, you know, let's face it, I mean, we have been marginalized, we have been scoffed at, we've been ignored. I mean, the mass media is a huge part of, of you know, spreading any message, but we are now in the age of social media. Um, I know, my, you know, my friend Jenny Cohn, she, she works through Twitter, and, you know, I, I, like, I tweet, like, once every month or so. There are people who tweet five times a minute. <laughs> we know this. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and that has the potential to go to critical mass pretty quickly if you got the message down. You know, I wrote Code Red with the idea that, okay, this is, you know, maybe this, maybe it'll catch on and sell a million copies um, at $10 million a piece and, you know, take care of my retirement needs. Um, but, um, but, you know, that, that that would be one vehicle because it would be spread around and people would find it compelling. But again, you know, it takes a lot of promotion. But these days, uh, it almost seems more like blogs and tweets, uh, social groups, Facebook groups and stuff um, are, are the way to go. Uh, part of the problem is that I don't think we've really coalesced on any particular message or strategy. There's still a lot of, um, you know, I mean, we're a bunch of cats, and, 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 as in herding cats. Um, and, and we have a lot of different point of views and points of view. Uh, the, the left in general tends to be, you know, more, more like that. Uh, we don't like marching. Um, so it is very hard. Back when I, I, I'm still technically executive director of Election Defense Alliance, but it's been kind of in hibernation for quite some time um, because it proved very, very difficult to organize around this issue. I do think that at this time, when you have this kind of, it's not just partisanship, but depravity out there, and there is so much threat that so many people feel, um, that you might be able to get uh, enough people to, uh, you know, feel that, on the one hand, it's an emergency and we better act, and on the other hand, we need to act in a way that we haven't um, be, been that used to. And, you know, because in a place like Europe, you have general strikes around the world. There are things that people do that in American culture, you know, we're, everything's taken care of, you, care of uh, for you here, especially if you're white and especially if you're middle class. Um, so we're, we don't have a real habit of being serious about resistance, about insistence rather than resistance. So, you know, there's the march and there's the parade and there's the petition and you send the letter to the editor or whatever. Um, but that isn't enough. It's going to have to be more than that. And, you know, whether you attach yourself to an organization like Voting Rights Task Force or you 
go it alone and start building a Twitter following and getting that, you know, a, a solid message out there, Paul Revere style, uh, with some solutions attached to it. That's why, you know, something like this uh, with, with risk limiting audits or some form of audit process is really valuable uh, because if you can't give people solutions, even, you know, potential solutions, uh, they just tend to go into despair uh, and shut everything down. So it is in the capability, I think, of individuals as well as organizations to address this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Thank you.